What's up, guys? Hey, it's Clint Coons here. And in this episode, what I wanted to do is interview someone when it comes to trust planning, especially offshore trust planning. You know, I get a lot of questions about this periodically on certain videos. People say, well, Clint, you know, that's a great strategy, but how about setting up those asset protection trusts or taking those uh, assets offshore and holding your entities in a Nevis asset protection trust or some other obscure jurisdiction? Well, here's the thing. I'm not an expert in it. In fact, we don't even set that stuff up. But what I want to do is I want to get this information out to you all that are interested in that. And the person that I know is Brian Bradley of Bradley Legal Corp. He's the uh, director, the partner. He started it. He's a director of the Asset Protection Council. This is the guy that I would send people to if they want to know about asset protection, taking their assets, putting them into a trust or going offshore, because this is what he does. Brian, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Clint, for having me on. You know, today's going to be a fun topic. It's going to be, you know, a little bit different. And I'm going to try to keep it fun and not that dense. And then I just hope that the concepts we talk about with trust and the different types of trust uh, help your listeners and audience understand and navigate this, you know, this little bit different world that we're in. Yeah, some are probably going, hell, two attorneys? That's crazy. I don't want to listen to those guys. It's, it's the most boring top of the conversation ever, but I think between the two of us, it'd be pretty fun. All right. So let's just start, jump right into it and break it down. You know, you've been doing this stuff and, and you, we've had conversations in the past about setting up asset protection trust. Who's the right candidate to, to consider using a trust? That, that's a great that's a great question. If we're just going to go strictly offshore, generally the right profile for a candidate, you're going to be high risk, high profile. So think of like a doctor, surgeon, you're making a generally a, a good high income. You're also investing in real estate, um, you know, probably like multiple states or in some commercial real estate. You're unprotected net worth. So like we're not talking about 401ks or 403bs. So your unprotected net worth is going to be over a million. Generally, we're seeing around 2.5 million or more, plus the risk that warrants it. Um, and so that's going to be your general candidate when we're looking at, do we want to go offshore or like, I would prefer just a general, like a hybrid, which is an offshore trust domesticated here in the U S. Um, but for the profile, it, it, it's just not someone starting out. You know, if you're coming to us with, you know, one or two properties or, you know, you're just, you know, a regular W2 employee working at Microsoft with a, a rental property, I would not recommend starting out with a high level asset protection trust. It's just way overkill for you at that point. Okay, so when it comes to asset protection trust, I mean, you mentioned a hybrid. That we'll unpack that in a moment. Um, this offshore concept. So you, you said you got to have a high net worth in order to go there. But what does that look like? I mean, if I wanted, to, if I was, I fit that profile. Immediately, what comes to mind? Tax evasion. Correct, and that's where one of the big concerns I think with most clients is we get stuck in watching. TV shows or reading, you know, like watching Netflix TVs. And when you're going offshore, it's not about tax havens. So like generally we're not going Nevis, we're not going Caymans, strictly we're going Cook Islands. And the reason you're going Cook Islands is they're, they don't dip their toes in taxes. It's strictly asset protection. And so you're not going to get the red flag that you generally would get if you're going to go to the Bahamas or you're going to go to the Caymans right there. Um, Asset protection, just in general, I think people need to realize it's tax neutral. So when people call me and saying, hey, I want to create an asset protection trust and I don't want to pay your taxes, you immediately need to bring up the conversation. Well, hey, great. Like, go talk to your CPA or wealth managers. That's tax mitigation strategies. If you're talking about protecting your assets from creditors and doomsday lawsuits, that's asset protection. We have to start tax neutrality. And so that's just a basic distinction that has to be brought up first right there. And then it's a matter of what country do we go to if we are going to go purely foreign. And like I said, I don't go to the other countries like Belize or those because you always have to build an outdoor strategy when you go to those other countries to the Cook Islands um, because there's too many, uh, what is it, agreements that we have like with the UN and the EU, like all these countries have or the US. They have other economic uh, resources like sugarcane, black pearls, um, tourism. The Cook Islands don't have any of those agreements. They strictly are asset protection is the only economic driving force that they have. So there's no tax involvement. There's no other economy. So they're always going to be the highest and strongest in keeping up with the whole world's asset protection strategies. All right. So if, if I was considering this and I say I had $10 million and I was concerned about asset protection and I wanted to set up an offshore trust. So what I'm hearing is we're, we're going to go to 
the Cook Islands and this trust is gonna be created. But immediately when I start thinking about trust, it comes back to control. So if I'm gonna send $10 million in assets right. to the Cook Islands, well, how do I know somebody's not just gonna say, thank you, Clint, and they're gonna put it in a suitcase and walk out the back door. Well, that, and that's, that's a great concern. And that's just not how the trusts are designed. And so when you're creating a, let's just go like a purely foreign trust, you're gonna have you, the trustee, the client who's creating it, you're gonna have in the reserve, your offshore trustee. So the Cook Islands trustee. And then you're gonna have a trust protector, which would generally be your law firm, your attorney, my firm, or your firm. It would be someone here based in the US. And so there's a check and balance system that gets created when the trusts are done properly of saying, okay, one, you're the client. So it's created for you, by you, they're called self-settled trusts, for you, by you as your own beneficiaries. Two, you're gonna have your law firm, your attorney as a trust protector. Their sole job is to overlook the trust and make sure the trust's terms and how it's being operated are always in compliance. And then three, God forbid you ever did have to have that doomsday lawsuit and you are now out of control and removed as the main trustee. That's when the offshore trustee comes in and steps in. They, their sole job is to only avoid being forced into complying with another country's or you know court orders, judgments, things like that. So they can literally just take that judgment, throw it in the trash and say, hey, sorry, we're not gonna recognize this. The trust protector's job is to look over and make sure, one, the offshore trustee only follows the terms of the trust. So that's what our job is. And then the other thing that people miss is when you do have offshore trust, you also have generally an offshore bank account, like a Swiss bank account. So the money's going into now the strongest banking system in the world and not a penny can be moved, not just without the clients knowing about it, but without their direct authorization and signature. And so what you want and why these, the foreign trusts are so effective is that you are out of control on them. So that means like in the US versus Grant case or you know the Anderson's case is like all these like really massive famous cases of bad people doing bad things, which I do not recommend. I just use them as teaching tools like don't do Ponzi schemes, don't go doing criminal activity, but it just goes to show the strength. You are out of control, so a court can't hold you in civil contempt to comply when the trust is done properly. Um, so you wanna be in control of your trust up to the point that it's not in your best interest with like a doomsday lawsuit. That's when those hybrid trusts kind of come into effect. You take an offshore trust, domesticate it, that puts you in control, God forbid a doomsday lawsuit comes crashing down on your world. We break IRS compliance by removing you as the trustee. At that point, you want to be out of control because you don't want a U.S. court or a judge to hold you in civil contempt to comply. Yeah, like the, with Anderson. Correct. So in that scenario, um, when I set up the trust, what position would I hold? As the trust? client? Yes. So if you're if you're... Using a hybrid trust, you would be the trustee, you would be the settler, and you would be the beneficiary. It's a self, they're self-settled trust and they're grantor trust. So they're created for you, by you, as your own beneficiaries. At the moment, we have to break what we call it, break a bridge, or we're just no longer complying with USC Section 7701. It's called the Court Test and Control Test. What we're doing is removing one leg out of that IRS classification. So you're still gonna be the beneficiary, you're just no longer the main trustee. That's when the reserve trustee, the offshore trustee steps in and does their job. And so they're already created when we create the trust. That's the benefit of it. We're not creating it after the fact. So from day one, the trust gets created. We're creating the, we're adding the offshore trustee in reserve. And their sole job is they only have power to come in under a declaration of duress, which us, the attorneys would declare. And then we are removing you as the trustee at that point. And now the offshore trustee steps in and does their job. All right. I, so so what, I, what I'm hearing then is that I would set up a trust. I'm the beneficiary. I set it up, you know, here with the local firm. We choose Nevis, or not Nevis, excuse me, Cook Islands as the, where, where the domicile for that trust shall exist with a Cook Island trustee. And then I open up an account in Switzerland so that means I have to fly to Switzerland to get the account? No, on? generally not. Um, the way that Swiss bank accounts have, it's pretty interesting, is you have an introduction. And so the firms who work in offshore trust generally have someone in their firm that are overseas, and they introduce you to the offshore accounts, you know, like the Swiss bankers. And then that's how you kind of get the ball rolling and creating that. 
But that's kind of the negative of if you go purely foreign, to be quite honest, is it's overkill and it's burdensome. And so for me, like I generally don't go offshore. I think I only go offshore with my high risk clients, maybe 2% of the time, 98% of the time we're using a hybrid because of all these crazy um, statutory hurdles um, that you have to go through and the IRS compliance and fact of disclosures and 1035 A's creating the Swiss bank account. Because if you're going to go purely foreign, there's no reason to then create a purely foreign trust and then connect it to a U.S. bank account because a judge can then freeze the money that you're putting in the U.S. bank account. So then you might as well just create the Swiss bank account, but then that comes with added cost. And so for most people going purely foreign, it's just overkill. What you want is the strength of that foreign trust, the statutory non-recognition that even if I lose, you can't get you my money, um, having to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, having the person suing you, you know, prove a, you know, what is it, a preponder beyond a preponderance of the evidence. You want all that really strong strength. You just don't want to pay for it until you need that strength. That's why you want to domesticate it. So when you create that hybrid trust, you're actually getting kind of the best of both worlds. You're getting that offshore strength in your back pocket like a tool, but then you're domesticating it so that then I don't have to deal with the IRS compliance. I don't have to go run to Switzerland and get a Swiss bank account right away. So we're able to combine the best of both worlds, kind of like a hybrid car. All right. So when you're saying it's domesticated, but it's hybrid, it's domesticated in the sense that I'm a resident here, so I'm the trustee and I'm the beneficiary. So it exists here. I open up an account here, say with Chase, and uh, I put my money into the Chase account. It's in the trust name and I can exercise control over that, make distributions to myself. But if I come under duress, then you tell me, Clint, you're no longer the trustee, you're out. Cook Island guy is the trustee, now the trust. But what happens to the money since it's still here? So then that's when you would want to create the offshore trustee would then help you create that Swiss. That's when you would want a Swiss bank account. And so when you get, let's just say like a hypothetical would be um, a fire in an apartment, you know, in your apartment, mm -hmm. rental property and somebody dies. So those cases are going to take time. So right when you know that's going to happen, we're going to probably exercise that bridge, crash it, remove you as the main trustee. If we're going to go to that extent and remove you as a trustee, immediately we're going to start creating the Swiss bank account, stripping the equity out or just fire selling everything right away. Move the money immediately and protect it. So because you're not going to go to that extent if you know, and breaking the bridge if you're not going to go into full tilt and create the Swiss bank account. But it needs to get done early on in the stage of litigation. Well, the, so when you open up the Swiss bank account, if you're not the trustee, how do I have signatory authority over it? Under what position would I hold? So while you're doing that, the, you would be creating it for yourself because it's your money, it's your bank account. Mm -hmm. So you're still moving the money. And so we would remove you from the trust as a trustee, but you're still the creator of it and you're still the beneficiary of it. You're just not the trustee of it at that point. And then you have the offshore trustee who's there to guide the process along because they can then take any authority that's needed to protect the assets in your advantage. All right, so if I had, um, let's say $20 million in real estate held in various limited liability companies, could I, if I wanted to protect those and put them into this type of trust relationship, I would assume that I would change the members on the LLC to the trust, is that correct? So the way you would set it up with like LLCs, and either like a Wyoming LLC as a management company or a limited partnership mm -hmm. is the only way to protect real estate. You can't move property. You can't move bricks and mortar. So the only way that thing that you're really protecting is the equity. So in the initial setup, what you're doing is having the LLCs be owned by your like Wyoming LLC management company or your limited partnership, like the traditional standard mm -hmm. way that you would create it. And then the bridge trust or a hybrid trust would be the owner of that Wyoming LLC or that management company. And then from there, in a doomsday lawsuit, the, the easiest and quickest way to protect what, are, what is that you're trying to protect your livelihood is the money, the equity. Like we, we can't take property with us. It's just an impossibility. So you're either fire selling it or you're doing an equity stripping. And I wouldn't even recommend stripping 100% of it because most courts hate that. So generally we would say like strip 98% of it and leave a couple percent behind. Um, but the cleanest and easiest way, you just sell everything, 
and then move the cash and put the cash into a Swiss bank account. All right. So how does this compare to using a domestic asset protection trust that it's offered, you know, in several different states? Yeah. So this, this level of protection is not for everybody. You know, like at the end of the day, for one. So if you don't have the high risk, you know, you don't, you're not an entrepreneur. You don't have a lot of real estate. Uh, you aren't a surgeon. I, w- I wouldn't recommend a bridge trust for you at that point. I'd probably just recommend a domestic asset protection trust. The difference is there's a lot of case law coming down now where there's just, the, the, ju- the courts aren't recognizing domestic cases and not all states recognize asset protection trusts. You know, I think there's only about 20 now that recognize asset protection trusts and have some sort of self-settled spendthrift legislation. An example of this, let's say you're a California resident and you try to create an asset protection trust. Well, California doesn't recognize them. They don't have self-settled spendthrift trust. So what you used to see is people running off to Nevada and creating Nevada asset protection trust. And then in 2012, the courts came down and like, sorry, we're not going to recognize this anymore. Kilcover Steelman came down and kind of put a squash to that and stop this. Um, And so what you're realizing is depending on the state that you in, unless you're in that state and the assets in that state, it's not going to benefit you. So you're not getting the benefit that you want. Um, so especially for these states that don't recognize asset protection trust, you're kind of in a situation where the only thing that you can do is create a hybrid trust. And then God forbid we ever have to utilize it. Now you can take your equity and your money and protect it away from a judge who's trying to execute a judgment on it. Yeah. I was smiling when you said that because I recently dealt with a situation, this uh, not really a law firm, but these attorneys, collective attorneys out of Utah, it's taken them, one of my clients for 30K. And yeah. uh, they'd set up for for her and her husband a California <laughs> asset protection trust. They yeah. said that it provides asset protection. Said, Give me a statute. Give me some yeah, case law. Sure. They don't have and it. No, oh, everyone knows this. It's like whatever. Yeah, yeah no, and and that's the thing. I, I honestly got to say, like for your listeners, is really vet when you're shopping around and ask for codes, ask for statutes, because just because people sell themselves as asset protection attorneys doesn't mean that they mm-hmm. actually are or that they know the laws of the states that they're they're practicing in. Because every state, some recognize series LLC, some don't. Some recognize asset protection trust, some don't. Um, so you really need to vet the person that you're talking to. And I would just ask for statutes and case law when you're talking to them. All right. So so if you know, you've heard about this and you know, asset protection trust or, or offshore trust, what you're saying is you got to vet whoever you're going to be working with. What are some of the questions someone should be asking if they're considering setting up this type of trust to know that they're not going to lose their money? Yeah. Um, One, ask about the checks and balance system that is set up. So, okay, you know, bring up your concerns. I'm concerned about somebody running off with my money. Very valid, very valid question. Um, So ask who's the offshore trustee? Why do you use them? Um, What role do you play? Who's the trust protector? What is the trust protector's role? Um, Why would I want to go purely foreign? Why not domesticate it? Um, Because then you also want to know about the cost. The maintenance cost of purely foreign trust is astronomical. Um, You're generally, we generally advise if you are going to go purely foreign, it's going to cost you about 35 to 40,000 just to set the trust up. And then they're average 10 to 12,000 a year just to maintain it plus the IRS disclosure. So you want to make sure that the attorney that's setting it up actually uses offshore trusts a lot because they need to know the statutes and how how to use them. Um, And then you also want to make sure that the type of client that they have matches your profile. Um, For example, like how many, if you're a doctor, how many doctors do you represent and how many doctors of your actually are using this? Um, If you're a real estate investor, how many of your clients are real estate investor based? Because you want to find the right match of an attorney for your specific needs. Got it. So when you talked, you know, you brought up the IRS and we talked about it earlier in this segment. Um, When you're using that hybrid model, since the U.S. resident is the trustee and the uh, Cook Island, in your example, contingent trustee isn't in control of the funds and all the assets are here. That's not an issue with the IRS because you haven't moved anything and they're not being controlled offshore. Correct. Correct. So it's domesticated. And if you're in a state that is one of those great states that has the self-settled Spencer legislations, that would be the state that we would domesticate your trust in. If you're a California resident, it would be only domesticated 
in Nevada to the extent we're just naming Nevada as the state of domicile. But it really is, you need to remember, these trusts are foreign trusts. You're just domesticating them by complying with USC Section 7701, naming you as the trustee and then naming a state just for the situs. And that's it. It's not when you're not actually creating like a Nevada trust or a you know Arizona trust. You're just creating it for compliance with the IRS. Now that's important because you know when you when you draft that trust agreement, that's where all that language takes place. Because with with a Nevada asset protection trust or a Delaware asset protection trust, there's specific language in there that refers to Nevada or Delaware statutes. Whereas I assume this type of trust that's a foreign trust, even though it's domesticated, it's still referring to the foreign jurisdiction and the powers that control that because you're choosing, you said you were the word situs. Uh, I'll let you explain that to people because that's a legal term and I, and I assume a lot of people don't know what that means. Yeah, it's not just like the, the, lo the location of where something is gonna have legal presence of. And, and, and I'm trying to find like a really dumb way down to it to explain this for your audience but it's just a location of where something is going to have a jurisdictional control over. residence yeah that's where it lives why it's here exactly yeah and so when we're creating these hybrid trusts you are creating a foreign trust we're just creating a a residence of where that trust is going to be domiciled yeah it's like if i went to spain and i decide i'm going to stay there for six years or so I got a house there. I got an address there in some location, but really my my home is still in Washington State. What you're creating is a trust whose home is in the Cook Islands, but it's just hanging out in Nevada for a little while until it decides, hey, I got to pull ship and go back. Correct. Exactly. It's like having two passports. You can have your U.S. passport, your Swiss passport, and as long as you have your U.S. passport, the U.S. is still going to consider you a resident. Got it. Yeah, so so it's a fascinating aspect of it. You know, I've never uh, I didn't look at the the domestication on the U.S. side. In and when I've talked to people in the past, I bring up the fact that there's a lot of reporting requirements are expensive to set up. But I see where, where your your angle is. Hey, why use that now? I mean, it's in case of emergency, break glass and then pay the funds. Let's keep you in control until that has to occur, and then you do it. You know, that's exactly what it is. You want it because if you were to try to create it after the fact, it's not going to work for you. So we want that strength and power in the back pocket, but we just don't want to pay for it all up when we don't need to use it. And so that's the purpose of domesticating it. Plus then a domesticated trust, you don't have to deal with all those IRS compliance and disclosures and factor disclosures and full trust disclosures that you would have to with a fully foreign trust. Okay. I got to ask this question. How many of your clients have had to break the glass? Oh man! So I thought it was going to be a low percentage. Yeah. And then I was talking to. You got to find better talking, clients in. <laughs> right. No, seriously. And so, I, um, so over like three thousand clients. So we've had to do this over like three hundred times. So we're just like a ten percent. Wow. And yeah, and every time, um, no one's ever followed down to the Cook Islands because like once they realize the Cook Island option's in play, they're not going to follow you down just to lose. So that's why all the case law you see from the Cook Islands is U.S. versus, SEC versus, IRS versus, because it's only the government that can really go down there just to lose. Um, but I was like, 10%, like that's pretty high. <laughs> and um, but it, but it's been successful every time. I would imagine, I mean, this is the way it's been in, in, in my practice, is that when a council is faced with this, they realize, hey, the barrier to collection is so high and the, and the likelihood is low that it's best to take policy limits or settle. And so you don't have to fully go through that entire process. Has that been your experience? That's exactly what it is. I would say nine times out of 10, when a client is calling panicking, your first job is to say, calm down. It's not as bad as you think. Just like you and I going investing in like a fix and flip, and we've never seen one before. And we just see like junk. And then the person that we're partnering with sees a gold mine. Well, us, it's like, we're used to the panics. We're like, calm down. It's not that bad. Nine times out of 10, just the threat of showing, hey, we have this offshore component. If you don't leave, I will crash the bridge and break the glass. They leave. The 1% that want to try to roll ball because they just don't understand the components of it yet, realize how strong it is once we do break the glass or, you know, cross that bridge. Um, and then they generally just take the insurance money or they just take the penny on the dollar and settle and leave and never come back. Yeah. And, and that's why 
so it's the same thing with what we teach people is that, hey, the, the more roadblocks you put up, people understand it. They want a quick buck. And, and if they know that it's going to cost too much to collect, they're, they're going to walk away. And that's really what, what you're doing is you're dry, you're forcing settlement. Exactly. And I wouldn't be recommending breaking a bridge like grandma slips and falls. Yep. No, you're not doing that. We're talking about catastrophic. You're going to lose basically like everything that you have, like your whole legacy is going to go down. That's when you would break these type of bridges. Um, pizza guy, you know, breaks his wrist. No, it's, it's, check your ego at the door. Just settle the case. And just for some of those guys that always ask me the stupid question, this isn't going to protect them from a divorce. Right. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a great question. I get this. I get this so, a lot. No, yeah. not an asset protection is not going to <laughs> not going to protect you from a divorce. Just realize that's your divorce court. Um, almost every state now has a presumption of community assets. Um, and even if your assets come in beforehand, a lot of it, you have that capital gains. You're going to be fighting it out through divorce court. So that's going to be an agreement between you and your ex or a judge telling you what you have and what the other, you know, your spouse has. Um, asset protection is not there to hide assets for a divorce. Yeah, I just wanted to get that out there before people start saying, hey, because I get this quite a bit. I'm just like. Go somewhere else. We don't even deal with those type of people. So uh, no, I don't either. I just yeah. send them. Here's a document and articles on fraudulent conveyance, and I'll send them from like four different firms just so they can see, like, hey, it's just not me telling you this. Like, this isn't going to work for you. Awesome. Hey, uh, thanks for coming on. Is there anything else you want to leave in passing? No, I would just say get your planning, whatever it is going to be in place beforehand. Because if you come to guys like us afterwards, it's like going to get insurance for your car after you get in the car wreck. It's just not going to work for you. So, you know, scale and grow. Just like get your planning and scale and grow with your plan and get it in before you get in trouble. Great. If someone was considering setting up an uh, asset protection trust to hold their various entities and assets, uh, they want to get a hold of you. How do they do that? Yeah, they can just jump on my website, www.btblegal.com. I have it more for education purposes, lots of case law. Um, I like people just be educated or just shoot me an email, brian, B-R-I-A-N at btblegal.com. All right, Brian, thanks for coming on. I'm going to put a, a link as well in the show notes so that if people just want to click on that link, it'll bring them right there. And, uh, you know, if this is something that you've been thinking about and you're wondering how to set it up, well, here's someone that can teach you how to do, I hope you do that. So thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. All right, take care.